everybody you're watching or listening to wake up call the podcast i'm your host christina previtt and joining me today is my guest flora quinby this is for the hashtag femstem series and flora is an aspiring astronaut and a manufacturing engineer for spacex welcome flora hi thanks for having me I'm excited. So I have to say, I have to maybe apologize. I am so not a science person. <laughs> so um, I know there's this debate about whether there's really such a thing as a science brain or an English brain or, you know, verbal brain. I kind of feel like there is because I don't think I excel in science, but very good with the languages and things like that. I think, think it kind of depends. Um, I grew up with uh, two parents that were educators. So I actually ended up in the more language writing side and one day just decided I wanted to be an astronaut and kind of focused on science and math ever since then. So you're either blessed with talents in both areas or that's just not even a thing. So I want to go back to something you said because I know you told me this story previously, but I want the audience to hear it and that's how you decided that you wanted to be an astronaut. Yeah, I, I basically, my entire life, I kind of anticipated I was going to end up in teaching or writing or history or some sort of um, education since both my parents were educators. And I had horrible science teachers growing up all the way until eighth grade. And in eighth grade, we were doing uh, earth and space science. And so I started falling in love with astronomy and stars and learning about all of that. Um, and we did some short videos. We made five minute shorts of scientists around Boulder, Colorado, where I grew up. And um, I was paired with some scientists from LASP, the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, which is part of CU Boulder, University of Colorado. And um, I ended up just sitting in on like a different presentation one day since my friend was sick and asked me to take notes for her. And it happened to be a former astronaut, his name's uh, Joseph R. Tanner, and he's uh, retired. And he was just telling us stories and we were asking tons of questions. And I was just kind of sitting there very silent. I was like very shy and was like, oh, I'm just going to take notes for my friend. And I think someone else in the group asked, what's the most important thing you can bring to space? And he answered, a spoon. And I just like sat there like awestruck because it's a spoon. Like, why would that be important? And like, everyone was like, wait, more, more important than clothes, like more important than food. And he was like, yeah, if you don't have the spoon, you're not gonna be able to eat the food because everything's packaged so tightly. Like you actually need this specialized spoon to like get the food out and eat it. And I don't know what clicked, but I like went home that day and walked into my like front, like living room or whatever and told my parents, I was like, hi, I'm going to be an astronaut when I grow up. And they definitely thought I was kidding. <laughs> like, they were just like, what? Like, let's sit down and talk about this. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Where did this come from? Um, and it was just like a weird moment where something just like clicked and I was like, that's it. Um, and like ever since then, you know, I've had him and a different astronaut, um, James Voss, uh, Colonel James Voss. They have both been my mentors. They were both part of this um, launching space video program that we did. And um, I've had them like, I had James Voss as a professor in college, um, which was really cool. Um, and I still talk to both of them pretty regularly, which is great. Well, um, that is cool. Yeah. Well, I have to ask you, you know, there's not a lot of women in that field, right? Not a ton of female astronauts, more than there used to be. When you were at that age thinking, I want to be an astronaut, did it ever occur to you, like even for a second, you know, that it might be harder for you because you're a girl? Honestly, no. And I think the reason why is because I, growing up, didn't really think of myself as different than the boys. I'm an only child. All of my best friends were guys, like my next door neighbor. He's basically my little brother now. Um, he, like, we would just play all day. Like, we would go out and build paper airplanes. Like, we would ride our bikes. Like, I was definitely one of the guys. Like, not necessarily a tomboy because I still played with dolls. But um, I kind of, like, got to have, like, sort of both sides. And I never thought of myself as different. And so when I decided I wanted to be an astronaut, I was like, oh, I'll just be like everybody else who's an astronaut. Like, that, like I'm just going to go do what I'm good at, become the best at it, like, whatever it is, be super passionate about what it, my goals and my future, and eventually I'll get there. And so it didn't really dawn on me until I think I was like in my engineering classes where I was like maybe one of like five girls every like once in a while for a class when it was like, oh, there are definitely lots of us. Like this is kind of important to also bring out the like, I don't know, feminine side to everything. Um, you know, one of my jobs, I was the only girl and we went storm chasing for 
this was like two weeks we were doing like uh, drone storm chasing and um i was the only girl and i didn't really mind it like i was close friends with all the guys um and i was actually all close friends with all their girlfriends too back like so we all hung out um in our free time um but yeah, it, it didn't really dawn on me for most of my life. Like I, I've kind of just always considered myself to be the same as everyone else. Um, well, I love that. I'm glad to hear that. I hope that starts to become the norm with the younger generations. Did you ever feel like the men ever treated you different? I mean, it sounds like they didn't, but did you ever feel like, you know, they were, it was like their boys club and I don't know, you were the girl. Honestly, I don't think I ever felt that way. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of like other women in STEM and they always say that they're treated differently. And I have to wonder if that's also partially on us and whether or not we're actually putting ourselves out there by saying, hey, we are women. Like, it's kind of like we want to be treated like women, but also don't want to be called out for being women, which is a really hard balance to bring about. And so for me, like I've just never... I never like point myself out as a woman in STEM. I'm just, I'm another person in STEM. I'm good at it. Like I enjoy it. I still ask questions. Like I don't know everything, obviously. <laughs> like I ask questions every day at work um, and they can ask questions of me and it's kind of a nice balance. And there's always going to be times where someone's going to think they know better than you. I don't think that necessarily means it has to be male, like a male doing that. Um, but in aerospace or in engineering or in STEM, it just happens to be that because there are more men in that field. And so yeah. I think it actually comes across as um, them explaining things to you that you don't need explained or them saying that they're better than you when it might not actually be that way. And it just happens to be that they're the ones saying it because they're the ones that are there. Um, I feel like every time I'm in a, like a woman field as well, like I, you know, studying abroad, it was mostly women um, in my like study abroad program. And it actually ended up being like, I felt more attacked by the women than I did by the men. And the reason why is because there were more of them there. And I was used mm. to being around guys. And I think that it really just depends on like the situation that you're in and who's there. Um, there's always gonna be someone who's gonna try and say, hey, I know more than you. Um, because they wanna show off what they know and that's great. Um, but you also like have to realize that like, in men's like in a man's field that happens to be STEM for the most part, and women are definitely you know, integrating more into it. It's just they're the ones that are there. They're, they've been there longer. You know, if you go talk to someone who was in like the Apollo era, like there were very few women back then. And getting the explanation, like of course the men are the ones with the knowledge because they were there for it. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily them saying, "Hey, you don't know everything. Like you're a woman, you don't belong here." It's more like, "Hey, I was." I was there during this time and I want to share that knowledge with you um, because I know you weren't there. Um, and so I think that's actually kind of a beautiful way to look at it as opposed to saying, hey, I'm feeling put down because I'm a woman and there's more men around me. Well, I'm glad to hear that. And it's interesting what you kind of observed about when all the women were together, because I've always said that women can be an, an incredible force if we're all positive and support each other and help empower each other. But when you don't see that, mm -hmm. you know, you see more criticism and competition, it can be just really damaging. And mm -hmm. I'd love to see more of the former. Same here. <laughs> and I think um, most of the time it is there. I mean, I think yeah. men have a similar way. Like, I don't ever feel like I'm being put down, like, in general. Uh, most of my friends, you know, as I said, most of my friends are guys, like they build me up. They're like, Hey, you're doing awesome. Like, good job. Like keep going. Um, you know, and I get that from women too. So I think it's nice to have a balance. Um, you know, and I love having like a feminine group and like, I'm part of a bunch of women in STEM groups. Um, but I also feel like sometimes that's a little sad, um, to be in just a woman in STEM group because we end up calling ourselves out more than the guys do. Like, yes, we're women. Yes, we're in these fields, but we don't have to always be like, oh, so-and-so put me down for being a woman. And it's like, well, okay, but like, how could you have changed that situation around and said, hey, like, look, like I'm a woman, woman in this field and I want to be treated as such, but I also want to be treated as a knowledgeable person on this team and kind of changing the direction instead of saying, I'm, I have to just be a woman in STEM. Like, you're also a person in STEM. Like, you can do the same job. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's like that balance that I was talking about. And so like, I love having the women groups. Like we share a lot of books. Um, 
and like personal development sort of skills. Um, but I really, I feel like it's very almost depressing and downgrading for myself when they start talking about how they're being treated in the workplace. Um, and I have to wonder, you know, is that all the guy or is it also some of how we're putting ourselves out there? Yeah, I have a coach that says something interesting. He says, what you see, you believe. Or no, I'm sorry, the opposite. What you believe, you, you see. see. So if you're looking for it, if you expect it to be there, you're always going to find evidence of it, even if it's not necessarily the case. So um, I, I totally get what you're saying. And maybe we could focus uh, whatever field you're in, you know, maybe focus a little less on that. You're always going to get the, the guy, I call them dinosaurs. You're always going to get the dinosaur. And it sounds like maybe you're working with people who are a bit younger. Mm hmm. Um, you know, I kind of feel like maybe we're going to phase out the dinosaurs <laughs> that think that way, you know, but they're just going to become extinct. Yes. Eventually. <laughs> yeah. They also um, are knowledgeable people though. I mean, you have to like give us the dinosaurs, like uh, the actual dinosaurs lived before we did. So like we learned stuff from them. So, the, you know, the men, the men dinosaurs that were here, they do true. have a little bit about our field that maybe we don't, which is always yeah. useful to be able to sit down and have those conversations and I don't know. I always learn a lot from our elderly folk. Yes, there's something, there's a certain level of knowledge that comes really from experience and not, not always book work. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your educational background. So you developed this passion for science and you wanted to be an astronaut. So mm -hmm. what exactly does an astronaut have to study going to school? Were, were you sort of on the astronaut track when you were in high school and college? Not really. Um, I think, so I went to private schools and charter schools as like a young child. Um, and I think that's part of why I ended up like having slightly different paths and meeting astronauts and things like that. Um, but I ended up going to a public high school and going into a public high school, there's generally like advanced classes, there's the AP level, there's the IB programs. And I was like new to all of it. Also, it was my first time ever having grades. And so I had a totally different like experience going into high school than I think most people did. Um, and so when I first got to high school, I was super focused on wanting to do advanced courses and also keep a ton of the hobbies that I had outside of school. I was like um, a soccer player, tennis player, volleyball player. Like I was definitely athletic. I played piano and I was like, I want to keep it all. And I was like, of course you can't. So I like made some deals with my parents and we figured out how I could do some advanced classes and some sports and still do piano. And so I ended up taking like one advanced science course and an advanced, um, I think it was like advanced history or something. And I like retook a Spanish course I'd already taken my freshman year. Um, and then I realized that I could definitely take on more. And so I always did advanced science after that. Um, I excelled in math. I went through the AP um, Calc two, no, Calc one and two, which is my senior year of um, high school. I really liked that. I always had tutors though in math. I like for some reason during the summer would just lose all of my knowledge and so like I'd have to start all over. So I ended up doing like math tutoring over the summer um, to keep myself in check for math, which was actually really helpful. Um, and then when I, um, during the summer, I kind of did some programs. So I did um, two years at the Advanced Space Academy down in Huntsville, Alabama, and they do simulations for actual like space travel. Um, so their, most of their focus was on the space shuttle program um and the international space station and they train you to scuba dive and um do all sort of certifications and like just a fun a bunch of fun training along with a ton of like aerospace history so you get to learn about the apollo era you know mercury astronauts gemini astronauts you get to see like saturn V rockets um it's at like where they have the um the uh, space uh, museum down in Huntsville, Alabama. So it's all right there. And um, I did that two years in a row. I think it was my sophomore, junior year of high school um, during the summer and absolutely loved it. Um, I mean, it was my freshman and sophomore year. And then my junior year, I studied abroad in Costa Rica and I got a totally different like immersion learning kind of experience. And it was in a different country. Um, and I still love Costa Rica to this day. Also learned that recently that they have two astronauts that work uh, for the United States, like as part of NASA that are from Costa Rica. And I think that's like the coolest thing because I didn't know that. And someone told me that and I just like got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to Costa Rica. I love it. It's gorgeous. Yeah. It's an amazing place to like 
just travel and see different things. They have a really cool culture. Um, and then when I got to college, I didn't really know what I wanted to study. So when you look at what most astronauts, like how they got to be an astronaut, most of them came out of the Air Force. And my family is Quaker. Um, and so going into some sort of military path wasn't really an option for me. And also like, didn't really sound like a lot of fun or kind of where I wanted to go. So I decided to, instead of going the military route, do an engineering route. And um, I applied to eight different schools, I think, and was focusing more on mechanical engineering um, because I felt mechanical engineering would be a good background. It gave me a lot of like basic knowledge in engineering, math, science, things like that, some hands-on. And then I could go do an aerospace master's and have a more specific focus. So that's where I started. And I went to Colorado State University for two years in mechanical engineering. Um, and double majored with their aerospace, which is like an engineering science concentration in space science. Um, and it was really fun. I got to meet another astronaut who's actually chosen for the Artemis program, which is really cool. Um, and he told me that I should always focus on finding a passion in life and then becoming the best at it. And for him, he went through medical school and then became an astronaut. So that's how I knew that there were other ways to go about it other than the military and um, that it was totally possible. So um, after two years in mechanical, I realized I didn't like mechanical. Um, the way that they taught it was very focused on car engines. And I really just wanted to look at rocket engines and do a lot more with um, like actual like human space flight. And so that's when I decided to switch schools and I studied abroad in Spain between that, like the year between, and I was supposed to go for a semester and then stayed because it was really awesome. That's cool. That's one thing I regret not doing during my um, undergraduate education was studying abroad. So I always tell everybody else, make sure you do that. I always but tell I'm, the one too. What was your actual degree in when you graduated? Um, it's a bachelor's in aerospace engineering. Oh, cool. So okay. bachelor's of science in aerospace engineering, which is um, as I got it from University of Colorado Boulder. So tell me about how you got your job at SpaceX. How did that happen? Yeah, um, that's a, actually kind of a funny story. So before my senior year, I wanted to have an internship. And I kind of hadn't really done any internships before. All my previous jobs, like I worked as a cashier sales associate for a small um, gourmet food home decor store in Boulder, Colorado for like five years. And that was awesome. Great customer service experience. That's why I'm good at talking to people. One of the more of a rarity in STEM. Um, and then I worked as an engineer and flight like member of a drone team where we built uh, small drones. And by small, I mean like medium size. Like the biggest one we have was like 15 foot in wingspan. Um, and we put scientific data like probes on these drones and then flew them near storms or at different atmospheric levels to try and get all sorts of atmospheric data for like National Weather Service, NOAA, NCAR, like all the big weather groups. Um, and that was really fun because I actually got to like build the aircrafts and then we'd go out and test them and I became a pilot for them so I could actually fly a bunch of them, which was really cool. And then we went tornado chasing in the summer. And so that was <laughs> really like, fun. Like Helen Hunt and Twister? Not yeah, quite as close, but you know, the kind of logic. Yeah, we, we would get in our little cars. We had a caravan of, I think, like seven or eight cars, and we just like go cruising down with our lights going. <laughs> it was, it was, Is that dangerous? Fun. We weren't too close. Um, so it depends on how close you get. Um, there's a really great discovery series. Um, I think it's called Tornado season or tornado chasing or something along those lines and it has meteorologist reed timmer who works now for the national weather service um and it's like it's his show and he his entire purpose was to go intercept tornadoes so he has this giant metal vehicle that has like drills down into the ground and the idea is that he get he literally gets in the path of a tornado to get the data we were not doing that <laughs> um we were driving probably like a couple miles away probably more than a couple miles really um and our plane would track our car. So we're driving and our plane's above us and we're going towards the tornado um, or towards the storm. And um, we got pretty close to the point where like you could get data, you could see things. There goes a plane, by the way. Um, I can't hear it. 
loud over here, but that's okay. Just, just for people talking. who are listening, um, Flora lives right next to LAX. <laughs> so the she giant, giant all the time. Um, but yeah, this, so we'd get pretty close and you'd get like really good video footage of the storm. And the second we hit hail, we would turn around. Our planes weren't particularly waterproof. They were close, but not super. Um, and we'd get really close, get this awesome data of wind speed. That was like one of the biggest things. And then we'd turn around and leave. Um, we got pretty close. Like I have really cool pictures of being near where centers of tornadoes would have formed, but it wasn't, the rotation wasn't big enough to actually form. Um, I have like pictures of like the wall cloud. Like we drove through a wall cloud at one point um, on like the outskirts, like heading out after some tornado chasing. And like we hit 78 mile an hour winds um, and we had different caravans. So we were teamed up with um, Lincoln, Nebraska um, University and Texas A&M, I think, um, or Texas Tech. And they had Doppler radar trucks. So the ones like with the giant bubbles on the back. Yeah. And then they had other cars that had like huge radar sensors like on top and like sticking out in front. And then we had our planes. So we had three different levels of data coming in. So we knew where the storms were. We weren't super close, um, but it was really fun. Uh, great experience. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half. And then I realized I wanted an internship in like human space flight because I'd kind of done different, all different types of uh, aerospace between like aviation and drones. And then I was like, all right, now we need human space flight side since that's really where I want to go. So I applied to, I think over a hundred internships and got one response from Virgin Galactic. And they um, were located in Mojave, California, and just recently moved to um, the Spaceport America, which is near Las Cruces, New Mexico. And their um, mission is to fly, uh, do commercial flights uh, suborbital. So they go up to the cusp of like the atmosphere where you can see like the actual cusp of Earth. Um, so you're considered an astronaut. And um, then they like fly you back down as like a glider. So you get this beautiful flight, incredible views. Um, they, so far they've done, I wanna say a couple test flights and they're, I think they're hoping to open it up to customers this year. Um, and so I ended up being an intern for them. Um, so I worked as an operations engineer. So I got to work with the pilots who are the astronauts and that was awesome. Um, and I got to work on like the simulator. So I got to like fly the simulator, which is also a lot harder than it <laughs> sounds. Um, but that was really a great experience. Um, I loved working for them and um, got to like fly a glider with some of the astronauts and like all sorts of fun things. Um, and still definitely close with a lot of them. Uh, they have a sister company still in Mojave, um, the spaceship company that builds the spaceships for them and then Virgin Galactic operates them. So, um, so what kind of cool stuff did you learn from the astronauts? Most of it was honestly just working with them on like, um, the simulations in their in like the cockpit and like they were showing me like tricks about how to land and like they had a specific like flight pattern for landing and they were like all right this is how we do it and I got to sit in mission control and watch them like go through um like simulations and trainings and it's really cool to see how they like how they change from being like outside in their normal day life to very, very focused in the cockpit. And I think that's just like one of the coolest things. And like they, you know, they go through their checklists and they're incredibly organized and incredibly like, I don't know, just very focused on their tasks at hand, um, which I absolutely loved getting to see. Um, and other than that, like I got to go flying with um, CJ Sturkow. He's a three-time astronaut. So two for NASA and one for Virgin Galactic. And um, he took me flying in his personal glider and told me to stall it. And I like hella stalled it. And I just like went straight down um, and then came oh out God, of it. That sounds scary. Yeah. <laughs> it is scary. Um, luckily you're high enough up that like you can pull out of it. Um, but like, I was like, I pulled out of it and he was like, man, that was like a really good stall. Like normally people don't go for it. And I was like, well, it's more fun to go for it. And I had stalled a plane before like a smaller Cessna. Um, it's different in a glider because you don't have any power to climb back up. So you have to go find some thermals and then it takes you up, but it was yeah, a fun oh experience. <laughs> so from what you know about it is flying a plane and, you know, navigating a space craft. Is it very different? It depends on the spacecraft. Um, so Virgin Galactic is basically a glider, um, their rocket powered aircraft comes back in as a glider. So it's very similar to flying a plane. Um, other things like the space shuttle, not so much. 
Um, the space shuttle literally gets launched vertically, it's on a rocket, it goes straight up, and then when it comes back in, it um, is also like a glider, except for it's coming in incredibly fast and needs three parachutes to slow down. Um, so you're landing a really, really, really fast, high-powered glider, which is really hard. Um, if you look at pretty much any other capsule, um, there isn't any control being done for almost any of it, as, except when you're in space. Um, if you look at like the Soyuz capsule or um, our Dragon capsule at SpaceX, both of those um, are completely autonomous on the way up because they're well on top of a rocket. And then when it gets into space, then you have guidance and navigation controls. So you have small thrusters that you can either manually control or also there's an autonomous version um, that keeps you on path for whatever orbit you're going into. Um, and then coming back in, you also kind of just orient it and then just come straight down. Um, and then it lands in the ocean. Sounds so, so easy. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> but I mean, I feel like I could just watch a few YouTube videos and I could do it. <laughs> yeah. So from my internship at Virgin Galactic, um, I made a couple friends there. And um, one of them, um, he switched over to SpaceX um, about a year ago now. And um, I got like a message from him in, I think it was like November when he had like first started. And his girlfriend's boss was looking for a new engineer and he like directly sent me an email with the like with this manager at SpaceX on the email chain and was like hey res like respond with your uh resume and just like a little bit about yourself and I was like okay and like just sent my resume in and was like sure great way to start and um I think at this point I had already applied to like 50 or 60 jobs and um like between October and November and um, just like all over, not just SpaceX, but like everywhere. And then, so I was like, I'll just send it in. Like, I'm not gonna get it. Like, it sounds interesting. Like, sure, like great way to get my name out, whatever it is. And he responds back like directly to this manager. And he's like, hey, why don't you apply here and we'll set up a time for an interview. And I was like, okay, sounds great. So um, I like applied like officially through their portal and um, got like a time to have like a phone screening with him where they basically just talk about your resume and like a little bit about your background and like what you know how proficient you are in certain things and then i was like oh i won't hear back for like a week the next day the hiring manager calls me and she's like hi so we like you but we don't know where we want to put you yet and we haven't even looked at the notes from your interview yesterday but why don't we like why don't i just like send you things and you just apply to them and i was wow. like okay sure so I think for about like three or four weeks, she called me either every day or at least once a week with like a new job for me to apply to or just wanted to check in about something. And like there was one night I was running on the track at the gym and it was like 10 p.m. and she calls me and I'm like, hi, like out of breath running at the track. And I'm like, hello. Um, and she's like, hi, I found another job for you to apply to. They um, really wanted you. Apparently. And so I ended up like applying to tons of jobs. And I think by, gosh, maybe like January, I'd applied to over 200 and um, like total, not just SpaceX. I think I had nine at SpaceX and 200 total. Did you and apply I, to Tesla? I did not. Um, I was looking at just aerospace um, or like aviation type jobs. Um, and so um, I ended up with like 20 different interviews between all these different companies and um, got hired as a part-time um, engineer for Blue Canyon Technologies, which is in Boulder, Colorado. Um, they're a satellite um, company, so they make CubeSats and MicroSats, which are just small satellites. Um, and they just got acquired by Raytheon like last week. Um, and so um, I worked for them for like a part-time job in the spring while I was still a student because I had very few classes. Um, and I was still interviewing at SpaceX and doing all sorts of other interviews. Um, but it was nice having like a couple options. And so March came around and they're like, okay, we're flying you out for an interview. And this is like the week before everything gets shut down. Oh. <laughs> so um, I fly out there for my interview and it's a, it starts at 9 a.m. And you go in and you give a presentation and then they decide whether or not they want to continue with the interview. And so uh, this is like my third interview for just this one position. 
and you're in a panel of like seven people and you're giving this presentation about a project that you've done. And so I was talking about the, the drones that I had built um, for the storm chasing. And they're asking me like really detailed questions that I don't always know the answer to. And I'm, I'm just like trying to field questions well. And then I leave the room and she comes back in 30 seconds later and goes, all right, here's your first one-on-one -on -one, and here's your schedule for the rest of the day. And it goes until 3 p.m. And this is a 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. interview, which is just like a crazy amount of time to be like fielding a lot of technical questions. And so I applied, this is a job I applied for, which was turbo pump and injector sub-assembly manufacturing engineer, which like I didn't really know what any of that meant <laughs> other than the engineer part. And um, <laughs> I like had done some work, like some research, but like it wasn't really like, I didn't really know a whole lot, but it, basically it's propulsion. Like it's a big form of the propulsion of the engines. And so my first question um, on my one-on-one, -on -one, this guy walks in and goes, what's a turbo pump? And I just like, I was like, I don't even know. I was like, I actually have no idea what a turbo pump is, but based on the word, it's a pump that has a turbine in it. And he goes, yeah, that's pretty much it. And I was like, cool. I don't really know what that actually means as far as like the actual manufacturing of it. So I keep going through all these interviews and by 3 p.m. I had like, I leave and I scheduled it so that I had a second interview the next day with the spaceship company, the partner to Virgin Galactic, because they were both in California and I was in Colorado. And so I flew out for both interviews. I leave at 3 p.m. completely brain dead. And I'm just like, that was so much work, so much effort. Like, I'm sure I failed all of that and I'm never going to hear back again. And so I went up to uh, Mojave for my second interview, spent the night, like kind of just like crashed, got up the next day. It was like, at least I know the people I'm interviewing <laughs> with. And so I went in and had my second interview. And about a week later, when I'm back, I get an offer from SpaceX. Um, I guess she called me like two days later, actually. And then I got an offer, um, like the official offer a week later. And I was just like floored. I was like, there. I had no reason to think that I was ever going to work at SpaceX. Like I had, like, I was like, I'm never going to be good enough for that. Like, <laughs> that sounds crazy. Um, and one of my cousins works at SpaceX, and so I'd been hearing stories for like three years about it. And um, I was just like, there's no way, like, how did that even happen? Um, and they're like, great, you have a week to decide whether or not you, you want to move to California and work at SpaceX. And I was like, okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so that's how I got the job. It was kind of like a really weird like referral and then just like got picked up by a recruiter. I hope you sent that friend a, a gift. <laughs> well, luckily I see him all the time because um, he still works here. Um, so we hang out a lot. So tell me about SpaceX. I, I feel like this is an embarrassing question, but what does SpaceX do? What are they known for? Uh, well, the biggest thing is that they're the biggest commercial um, human space flight system in the United States. We're currently the only uh, certified through NASA crew um, mission, like company. So we're the only people on uh, US soil that can launch humans to space, which is pretty impressive. So uh, is this like for, you know, for official <laughs> um, projects or, you know, I know like, you know, Elon Musk is trying to do it so that, you know, normal people can just go off into space, but I think we're a ways off from that. Is that sort of what they're trying to do too? Yeah, so there's a, there's about four or five different parts of SpaceX. So there's um, the original like program was Falcon, so Falcon 9. And Falcon 9 rockets, the idea was they wanted to be like reusable boosters. So there's a first stage, a second stage, and then like either uh, satellites or a capsule on top. And um, they wanted the first stage to be reusable because that's an incredibly expensive, huge piece of um, machinery engineering everything and they wanted to be able to obviously save some of that money so the first project was launch a rocket and then have that bottom part reland so that we can reuse it so now today that first stage lands itself on either a drone ship or a landing pad um, every single launch um, so we always save that bottom booster which is awesome um, we lose that second stage. It burns up in the atmosphere. Um, it launches the satellites up or it launches the, the capsule up. So the first thing that SpaceX did was let's get a rocket that works. Um, and second, let's start launching satellites. So they had contracts with NASA, with um, Boeing, with big name companies that wanted satellites to go up into space. And that's where SpaceX started was they started launching that. 
Um, then SpaceX said, well, we also want to have our own satellites. So they started building Starlink. Starlink is this international um, internet service where there's going to be just basically a mesh of um, satellites at one altitude that provide internet for all of Earth, anywhere you want, which is awesome. Um, and so we launch about 60 satellites at a time, which is huge. Um, and that all goes up on our Falcon 9 rocket. Um, we also launch other satellites. So um, like uh, NREL, um, like some secret satellites for Air Force, like um, the uh, Space, Space Force, I guess, has some satellites that we've launched. Um, and then NASA now has contracts with us for our crew because we're certified now. Um, so about a year, year and a half ago, um, Boeing, Starliner, and um, SpaceX's Dragon were the two that were competing for this commercial, um, like commercial uh, ability to fly a crew. And uh, the only one that got certified was SpaceX. Um, I think Boeing had some issues with their Starliner and didn't get the certification. So that's where uh, SpaceX got all the contracts from NASA. On top of that, SpaceX is also building um, a new spaceship down in Boca Chica, Texas, which is called Starship. And the idea for that one, that one's going to Mars. Um, so that's going to have, um, actually, they're still in design phase, so I'm not even sure what they're going to have. But they, um, the idea is that it's going to be a much larger, much like bigger in diameter rocket. So it'll hold a lot more people. Um, and then uh, the idea is that there's going to be a bunch of those launching all the time. And so you'll have um, constant like spacecraft en route to Mars. Um, so that's the newest um, focus. What are they going to Mars for? Uh, to build life, like build new civilizations there. Wow. Yeah. So those are like the biggest things. There's also Falcon Heavy, which is basically a three booster version of the Falcon 9, which is a single booster. Um, that flies every once in a while. It's a little harder to get going. Um, but so that's like, there's a bunch of different sides. So SpaceX kind of does all sorts of different things. Um, but so how close are we to just having the average person be able to go into space? Honestly, I'd probably say in the next decade. Really? Yeah. It's probably going to be incredibly expensive. I think the idea is that it's, at least for SpaceX, they're trying to make it more affordable. Virgin Galactic also is quite affordable as far as like suborbital, um, like small, like quick missions. Um, if you look at like some of the bigger companies, like internationally, there's other companies that are looking to do some more things. Um, and like currently, I think the cost is high because, well, one goes every once in a while. <laughs> um, but once it starts going regularly, that cost will come down. If you look at how like aircraft worked, when we first started having airplanes, the cost to fly an airplane was incredibly expensive. And now you can fly for what, like a hundred bucks to Colorado from California? like round trip like so it's very like it kind of fluctuates depending on day obviously but um i think when we start to see these this ramp up as far as being a, a constant or weekly thing i think the cost is going to go down significantly which will be really exciting to see yeah and you know i think when people first started flying too a lot of people didn't want to do it because it was just seems so incredible that you know it's so dangerous you know you're gonna die it's only a matter of time and I'm sure that that will be repeated with going Definitely. to Mars. I feel bad for the moon. Nobody cares about the moon anymore. Well, we're going back done to the moon now. Sorry? Uh, we're going back to the moon. Um, so the Artemis program for NASA um, is the new lunar astronaut. So they're the ones going back to the moon. And they're, I, I want to say, set to go in 2024. Maybe not 2024, 2030. Something soon is the oh, idea. Soon, yeah. Um, and it has uh, Lockheed's partnering with them to help build some of their things. I believe uh, either ULA or Northrop are building parts of it um, as well. So a lot of the big name uh, aerospace companies are helping with the lunar push. Um, I think one option for Starship um, is also to go to the moon first before going to Mars as a test, um, which is obviously easier to get to the moon than it is to Mars. So um that's also a possibility i guess i'm having a hard time because this is really new to me so thank you for sharing all this information what would people do at mars i mean it sounds like there's probably going to be a mcdonald's there <laughs> exactly, yeah. i think the biggest starting point for mars is going to be figuring out how to 
like produce life. So plants, like growing things, there's gonna be a lot of like greenhouses. If you look at, there's a lot of um, interesting sort of like terraforming ideas. So if you look at, there's, there's a couple um, actually on earth that they've started to try and like mimic for Mars um, or like they have simulation, simulated plant places that are basically little hubs that are bubbles. Um, like I know Hawaii has one. There's a lot of programs where future astronauts are going to train in a lot of these places. Um, and so you're allowed to have your suit off inside, you're growing plants, you're living in this little like hub, this little bubble that has um, its own like source of air and it's filtered and everything. And then when you leave, you go on a spacewalk, so you put on your spacesuit, and then you can go outside and do experiments. So you're collecting rock samples and doing experiments on it. You're trying to figure out how to like collect dirt and grow um, different plants in different soils and different lights. Um, with different types of like water, or, like whatever it is. Um, you know, if you look at International Space Station, some of their experiments, uh, the biggest one recently was that they grew radishes up there um, in different soils and different light conditions. So they tried to, to mimic how we were going to change things on either the moon or Mars. Um, so I think that's going to be the big first thing we're going to start seeing is these huge hubs that are going to be set up for producing life, for letting people live there. Um, you know, I, I would expect. Um, that there's going to be probably one longer duration mission in the beginning to try and get all this set up with a lot of um, cargo pods coming with a lot of supplies, but a lot less people going. Um, I guess, I think it was a, maybe 2015, 2016, uh, NASA released or asked people uh, who would be willing to go on a one-way mission to Mars. And that was this original, the original idea was, hey, we're going to have this one-way mission to Mars, go and we'll just leave you there. And you can do all your science and you can figure everything out and we'll send cargo, but we're not gonna send any return pods because the idea was that it's too expensive to come back. And so I signed up for that list. Um, you did? I did, back in like 2016 or something when I was in high school. Um, I guess it was like probably 2013, I guess, when I signed up, but- Would you um, really do that? Would I you be alone? No, you'd go with a group of people. So it'd be like this group that all goes and then you'd basically live out your life there was the idea. Um, you would really do that. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting, particularly for the science. I think a lot could get built. And also I have like, I have this little bit of faith that if we actually did send people there, there would be a huge rush on earth of how do we get more people there and get more people back, um, creating different like stations, different places that people can go, um, I think is that huge jump. I mean, if you look at like every sci-fi movie ever, they have infinite space, like space stations, like everyone's like hyper jumping through time and space and like going to all these different planets. And I think everyone loves that idea. And I think it's just a matter of how do we get there? And so starting to like terraform or like create something on Mars for life and society is like a stepping point. And I think once someone's there, everyone's gonna be like, all right, try and like, now we've got to make a huge like international network and like universal network, literally, um, where you can like jump between these places. And so I don't think it would actually have ended up being a one-way mission. I think it would have been like, sign up for a one-way mission, but like in 20 years, we'll probably come get you. Oh, so. that sounds like such a long time though. I mean, what if you get sick? What if you need a doctor? Um, almost every astronaut has medical training. Um, that's part of the part of the training. Uh, they have to be certified in basic medical things. And I, if, if you're going to Mars or another planet, they're going to send at least one doctor. I was so going to say, what if you need an appendectomy <laughs> or, you know, some emergency? <laughs> I, I can't help, you know, it's my lower brain is like yeah. thinking of all these liabilities, but. Oh, there's plenty. I'm sure, I, I'm sure that there's a, a lovely list that NASA has already for any space station sort of thing. Cause I mean, people go to the space station and stay for up to a year. You know, what if you have the same situation up there, they can't send you back. So obviously I'm sure that they have some sort of medical area up there. Um, but they also only send candidates who are in perfect health. So the likelihood is a little bit lower. But what about mental health? I mean, it's how can you predict what somebody's meant, how they're going to react from a psychological perspective when they are up there? Lots of uh, training and simulations. So astronauts that go get um, NASA astronauts, they get picked from a class every four years. So uh, they just picked their most recent class of astronauts for uh, 2020. The next astronaut class will be 2024. And they give you, they give the astronauts two years of intense training. So you do simulations, you go scuba diving down 40 feet in a pool in your spacesuit, and you are doing work in a weightless environment. Basically, that's the idea. Um, you are training for every um, possible outcome. You do anomaly training. So whatever could go wrong, 
they like prep you for it and you like have to figure out how to handle it. Um, you know, you, you do missions where you're talking to mission control um, from like a simulated environment. So you're um, say cooped up in basically like a tank and you're, you know, breathing through your um, hoses into your suit and you're imagining you're on a spacewalk and you're outside and you're doing something different. You know, you're communicating to the people inside the space station. You're also communicating to the people on earth um, to do whatever mission you're supposed to be doing. If you're on the International Space Station, you're fixing issues that are like the actual hardware of the station. Some of it needs replacement, you know, you're replacing filters, you're reattaching things, you're detaching things, you're moving things around, um, all sorts of different things like that. You're training for all the different missions you're gonna have scientifically, so growing plants. Um, they do a lot of um, medical research up at the International Space Station um, with different like cells and how different things react in different weightlessness. Um, environments and different um, other simulated environments. Um, and then the rest of the time you spend working out because you have to keep up your body mass um, and your muscle mass while you're up there. So um, they do an incredible amount of training and prepping you. And you do psychological evaluations during your training. You know, you go in, um, if you ever get a chance to like watch, um, there's a couple different films, like there's a new one on Disney Plus, um, The Right Stuff. It's about the, um, the first generation of astronauts with John Glenn. And um, they do look at your psychological side. So they go, hey, like what, like they have you like fill out questionnaires and like you sit down and you fill out different things. And, um, you know, they test you in uh, incredibly uncomfortable situations. Like they turn up the heat and they're like, all right, you know, if you're sitting in a really uncomfortable room where you're, you're sweating and like you're like, how are, how are you going to react to the same questions that we're giving you? Or, hey, there's a super loud noise that's now going to just be consistently there. Um, you know, how do you handle those sort of situations? Um, and so I think they do have, like, a lot of training that goes into that. Um, also, even just applying to be an astronaut, the, the process of the application and the interviews um, also tends to weed out people who may not be um, as strong um, or as capable mentally. Um, it's a very, very long process, um, like months, like they just announced the 2020 astronauts, 2020 astronaut applications were due in March and they just announced them in like November. So like it takes them that entire time to do interviews and you're doing incredibly difficult panel interviews with people. Um, and so I think overall, they actually do a really good job um, for that. Obviously, I think it'll be different in the future as we start like sending everyone um, and I think that's going to be a very different sort of uh, look. Um, but I also don't think those are the ones who are going to be the people doing the repairs. Um, you know, those are going to be the ones who are going on vacation to stay on a lunar hotel or whatever it is. Um, and I think that will be a very different look than, say, the people working at the lunar hotel or, say, the people working on the actual space shuttle taking you back and forth. Um, and so the mentality might be slightly different and that regulation around it will be different. So you can just apply to the NASA program. Yes. I mean, obviously, I, I would imagine you have to have certain credentials. Mm -hmm. So is that something you're going to do? Yeah, I'm applying to the 2024 class. Um, basically, their current regulation. So uh, I guess like a year ago, maybe two years ago, they switched it from um, you had to be 30 to apply and they took out the age limit. Uh, but you do have to have a master's. Um, so currently you have to hold a master's in some uh, aerospace or engineering or related STEM field. Um, or if you're a pilot, you have to have a certain number of hours, uh, which is where the Air Force comes in. So I'll be applying to 2024. I'm planning to get my master's in the next couple years doing like night school basically for aerospace. Um, and then yeah, I'll be applying in 2024. But the likelihood of getting it is like super, super small. They have like hundreds of thousands of applicants and they choose like 13. So. Yeah, but you didn't think you were going to get the SpaceX job, and we, we see how that worked out. But every astronaut I've talked to, they said they took two to three times to apply before they got accepted. So I'm expecting to, like, not get it for at least, like, two times. So Maybe. I have to say, you gave me so much more time than I promised you. Um, thank you for being That's so fine. generous with your time. I really appreciate it. And I'm so impressed with you. Thanks. You're, like, you're my idol now. Yeah. <laughs> and uh thank you for being such a, a wonderful role model for other girls whether you realize it or not you are we need I'm definitely working like on you. the 
getting more girls interested. You know, I've talked to the astronauts, like Joe Tanner and I have really been like talking about it recently. Um, and he was like, you're just the oddball out. Like normally you have to get to the girls before they're in like sixth grade. You have to talk to them like fourth, fifth grade, because by the time they hit sixth, seventh grade, they're being told they can't do this. Like they're being told that they're not good enough by their peers. Maybe even their parents aren't like encouraging them mm -hmm. enough. Uh, they don't have these great role models. And like, for me, like, as I said, I had terrible science teachers growing up. Like, I think most of my science teachers were like, let's go take a walk through nature and point out foliage. And I was like, that's not science, <laughs> like, you know? Um, and so I think what I really want to do, and I, I started a nonprofit uh, with my fiance, actually, um, it's called Thinking STEM. And we're creating videos and blog posts, and we're going to write some books. And the idea is, why is science important in the everyday world? You know, we our first video is up on YouTube. We um, literally did a taste test of how to make the perfect cup of coffee. Okay, Ooh. we did it by measuring in grams and like milliliters. And we're like, look, like here's science stuff that you use every day. You know, we were on a walk the other day, like on a hike talking about, I want to say like a calculus principle or something. <laughs> and like, I was explaining it about like how it, it like made total sense when you like put it into like the real world concepts. And Tanner, my fiance, he just stops walking and goes, oh, that's what it is. <laughs> like, this is like years later after we've taken it in school. And like, it just all of a sudden an epiphany, he's like, oh, that makes total sense. Like, of course it makes sense in the real world principle. And I was like, yeah, this is why we have to teach it in real world concepts, because I could give anyone an equation and be like, here's a useful equation. And they're like, why? I'm like, well, here's why, you know, in school, there's many times when people will say, you're never going to use this again. Like I've mm -hmm. heard that so many times yeah. and I'm like, but if I thought about the actual principle, I might be using it every day subconsciously because someone already figured out the math for me and made it into why you use a cup, for instance. Like a cup generally is between like maybe five and 10 grams off from a certain measurement of weight based on some scientific mathematical principle of why you need X amount in a certain recipe. That's science, like that's the math behind it but no one talks about it in the everyday world. That so is really cool. Except you guys, you guys talk about it. You should put that on Instagram. Does thinking STEM have, yeah, it's did, on, did I get that right? Thinking STEM? Thinking STEM is yeah. that on Instagram? It is. It's under my link tree. Um, and it's uh, literally, I think called thinking STEM. And for people who are listening, you can find Flora on Instagram at astronaut Flora, F-L-O-R-A. And go to her link tree and find this stuff on here. It's yeah. really cool. Thinking STEM should be the first one. That's yeah, I see it there. That is yeah. very cool. And I will have links to your you on social media and Thinking STEM on in the show notes. Very cool. I love this. This yeah. is really and so cool. I really want to get. I think my passion is I want to get the younger generation interested and go. You know, maybe you're not going to understand why the science is important or, you know, when you make slime, like I know a lot of kids like to make the like gooey slime thing because it's fun, um, but there's a huge scientific point of it and it's really cool. So we want to talk about that and like adults, um, you know, I surpassed my parents in like math and like, I guess, geometry or algebra too. So like, there's a lot of things when I try to explain it, it's confusing and I'm like, but this mathematical principle is logical because let me compare it to something in writing or let me compare it to something in language or my mom's an art teacher and so I try and relate it to art and so there's like a lot of ways in which you can relate the scientific and mathematical stuff that we're taught in school to those everyday things and so that's what I really want to get these younger generations and particularly women to yeah. see you know I mean if you look at like makeup like that's one thing I want to do be like okay, why is makeup a certain way? Like the science behind makeup is really cool. Like, that's awesome. Like we should talk about it. Yeah. We should understand our world. I actually have a goddaughter who's seven yeah. and I would love for her to have some exposure to this stuff because I fear that a lot, of, and I don't know how it is in school now, obviously it's been a little while since I was in grammar school, but I don't know what it's like now for girls. You know, are, are they having more exposure to the sciences and being encouraged more to participate in that or not? I mean, when I was, and I'm sort of ancient, but when I was in school, you know, the girls didn't take, you know, wood shop and things like that, which seems so silly, right? Like, why shouldn't they? 
Um, I don't think they're really doing that anymore, but I'm not sure how much encouragement girls are getting to go into those fields. I think it also depends on the school. Um, you know, I think almost every school, if, if someone looks for it, there's going to be a robotics team. There's going to be some sort of design club um, or robotics club or something that's very engineering. You'll find that most of the people in those are men and are young guys that are interested. And for a young girl who's say in high school or middle school, maybe that's intimidating. Maybe that's not really what you want to go into. You know, you want to hang out with your girlfriends. But what if there was some sort of different science club that maybe that still does similar hands-on things, but is um, focused on more like girl stuff. Like I know a lot of the ones that the guys go into, it's like cars, like they build cars or robotic like arms or things like that. Well, maybe that's not what the girls want to build. So when I was um, in high school, like I was part of, I think I took like a design class or something and I made like three, like 3D hexagonal pieces with a laser cutter and like put it together as like a puzzle. Cause I liked puzzles and I was like, that's kind of cool. Um, so there's all sorts of things that you can do. You know, you can make beautiful signs, you know, like those live, laugh, love signs that everyone yeah. has houses you can make those you can laser cut those like that's really cool um you know like you could do it with whatever word you want like that's woodworking in and of itself um you know i worked in a machine shop um in college before i did the drone stuff and um i got really lucky and uh three or four of the other people in there as a like assistants were women and we were like, we just had the best time talking. Like we had so much fun. Um, and like, we got to help all these other students like learn about it. And then I kept encouraging more girls to join and like go get a job there. And yeah. um, I just recently, about a month ago, talked to um, a freshman class at my university and they have a freshman projects class that is taught by a professor that I really liked who invited me to like give a presentation. And since then, I think like three or four girls have reached out to me about joining the things that I did. And I was like, that's, that's so cool. Awesome. Like, just go do some of this stuff. Like it's, it's different. And like, yeah, there's going to be guys, but like, so what? Like show off that you know something. You're going to get really great friends out of it. Maybe you'll date one of them, like whatever it is, like you're going to have a good time. Um, and I think like, I think you can still have all that sort of girly stuff. Like, yeah. I like I just got my wedding dress the other weekend and I was like like had the best time just like in the shop <laughs> trying on wedding dresses and like you know I definitely wear heels and like I have fun being a girl but like I still enjoy my job and like at my job I'm required to wear steel-toed shoes and um I got ones that are heels that are like I was gonna say can they be pointy can they be yeah uh, I got really cute ones from this really awesome company that makes with like stylish women like steel toe shoes like work I wear. think I saw that on your Instagram yeah. page but you know what I don't even I would love to see a time when nobody even has to think about well then nobody even has to have this conversation right mm -hmm. that you can still be a girl and like makeup and smart sparkly things and clothes but still you know like science like why does there even have to be this distinction between the two things like what do they really even have to do with each other yeah, I, there really shouldn't be like, I, it's similar to like, if guys really like performing in the theater, like, for some reason, you're, like, when I was growing up, like, they would always be called, you know, they, they would always be like, oh, they're too feminine. And I'm like, but they're just like, they're really good at being like a performer. I am, I am terrible at being a performer. Like, I am not an actor whatsoever. So like going to see my friends that were guys in these amazing plays where they were playing incredible roles and like, making me believe something that's so cool. Like, yeah. why should that be considered feminine though? Like yeah. that doesn't make sense. Particularly when, if you think back in history, women weren't allowed to perform and men had to dress up as women. Yes. Yes. Right. Why, Isn't that interesting? Is <laughs> so there's things like that that are like, I think there's a lot of stuff in history that we really should take some, some pointers from, but also there's a lot of things where we should be like, why, why is that a thing? Like, if you look at amazing women in science, you look at Amelia Earhart, you know, she was, just a revolutionary, like she went and di she didn't really care. She was like, I'm going to do it regardless because I want to. Like I grew yeah. up reading biographies about her and I was like, I want to be like her, you know? And like, that's, yeah. that's so cool. And so I think, I think it's more at this point, a lot of um, young girls need someone that they can look up to that says, you can do whatever you want. You can set your mind to whatever you want to do and go do it. 
it doesn't matter if your parents say that you can't do it. It doesn't matter if your friends say that you can't do it because clearly you need better friends if they're gonna tell you that first off. And second off, someone else out there is telling you that you can. And like, that's yeah. the important part. Like, I've had like a bunch of recent encounters. Like I kind of like deleted Facebook and Instagram off my phone because I was getting really like sad during the day looking at like all the, like the bad things happening in the world and like people being like very contradictory of themselves on social media. And I realized I don't need that. Like that, like I can go on it when I need to, but like, I, I know what I want to do. Like I know who I am and I know that I want to inspire other people to do what they're good at, to find their passion. And that doesn't have to be STEM, but if it is great, <laughs> like I probably have a lot more like to talk to you about if it's STEM, but um, you know, I want people to find those passions in life. And I don't care if someone decides that they want to like copy me on whatever I do. Like, I'm not trying to be the only person in my field who does this. Like, I know that there's a lot of other women who do this. I know that there are men in my field that do this, that go out and inspire people. And that's awesome. And like, I'm just another voice. Like, that's all I am. And if, if someone else wants to go be a voice like me, like, great, that's awesome. Like, it's all about talking and communicating and saying, you're good enough. You can do it. You're you. Like, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, it's just, you just being in the field, uh, uh, just that alone is inspiring to, to see, you know, a, a female face that's in a profession that people might otherwise associate with a male profession. And I love that you're talking about it too. That's even better. Yeah. If you look at um, SpaceX, actually SpaceX, I think is one of probably the best ratios, um, like male to female. Um, I think it's pretty like, I want to say it's maybe like 40% female. It's really high. And our, literally oh. our president is a female. Wow. And like, she is like, she's Elon's right hand. Like, and that's so cool. Like she is there. She's at the top. Like that's huge. So I think it's totally doable. Like, I mean, it's always, it's going to be a struggle for anybody, but I think, I think what maybe like almost false media is that it's a struggle for just women. It's not, it's just as hard for guys. I got a job before Tanner. I make more money than Tanner. Like, and we're both in the same, same, like same, similar roles. We're both engineers. He had a better grade. He had like better grades in school. He graduated with more honors. And yet like, we're still doing really, really good work. So it's not just hard for girls. Like it's also hard for guys. Like, yeah, it's also a weird economy right now, but like, it's just as hard for them to climb a ladder. And I think that there's two sides to being a woman. One, you're going to get called out because you're a woman, whether that being a good thing or a bad thing. You get called out saying, wow, you're a woman in this field. That's amazing. And you're like, yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Or you're like, you're the only woman in this field. Like, in, like, how do you, how does that make you feel? And honestly, like, you're there. Like, that's so cool. Like, it's, it's, you know, you've got there. However it's many years it took you. However, like, whoever is going to make it hard for you, you know, you're going to have to climb some ladders. You're going to have some hurdles. But like, think about how strong you're going to be every single time you have to climb one of those hurdles. Every time you get to prove something, you're not proving it to the whole world. You're proving it to yourself that you are that good. Like I, I got hired at SpaceX. So I got hired for that turbo pump and injector position. Uh, that's not my position. I'm a totally different role. I'm propulsion subassemblies. So I work on everything but the turbo pump and injector, oddly enough. Um, and I own 700 parts for SpaceX. So I am responsible for 700 parts getting to the engine every time we build an engine. That's crazy. Most people do not own this many parts. That's way more complicated than the Wayfair furniture. <laughs> way more complicated. And they don't all go together. It's even weirder. Um, but yeah, and I started with one other guy and he had been there for three and a half years and he was super knowledgeable and, um, he like, we like tag teamed it and we each owned about half and I got there and I started in May, like a week after graduation and, um, like was owning a bunch of parts by like August. Well, two, two ish months ago, three months ago, he decided, I guess it was two months ago. I don't know. He decided to switch to a different role at SpaceX and I was left being the only engineer for my team. I was there four months before I all of a sudden was responsible for 700 parts by myself. Um, had I have a team of technicians that help me. Like I ask them questions 
constantly. Um, and they ask me questions constantly. I talk to tons of other, uh, other engineers around SpaceX. I talk to other people who have to prove things. I talk to my managers and I'm like asking questions constantly. I'm constantly learning, but I am still doing a really good job. I don't have, like I have taken on, since I've taken on all the other parts, I've taken on an additional 80 parts, including one that isn't even for an engine, which is crazy. And so I'm like building all these new things and I'm accomplishing a lot more, but I'm not proving it to anybody else. Like, yeah, you are, but like, I'm proving it to myself that I know my job, that I'm able to do my job successfully and that I'm able to still learn about my job every day. That's totally different. Like, and that's, that's what I think, honestly, all girls and all people should aspire to do is, are you proud of yourself in your job? Are you proud of yourself as a human? Like, do you like who you are? If not, figure out what you don't like and fix it because it doesn't matter what anyone else says they like about you, but do you feel like you're accomplishing what you want to do? Well, it sounds like you found your passion. I think so. Yeah. Awesome. I know we're going to see you in space (laughs) and I would like to reserve an interview during, after that. Of course. So I know NBC and, you know, CBS and all of them are going to want you, but I'll come back here first. (laughs) Thank you, Flora. I appreciate that. (laughs) So I just gave your um, Instagram information. Is there any place else that you would want people to look for you? Uh, Well, that thinking STEM, um, we have, it's thinkingstem.net. It's yeah, still, uh, we're still working on getting it up and running, but um, we're working on it. It's Sounds good. like it's going to be awesome. Yeah. And then Facebook is pretty much the same as Instagram. Um, Facebook is, I think, and then I, I use LinkedIn a lot. Um, I, oh, I, really? I, I try and advocate LinkedIn as much as I can. I think um, there's a lot of other platforms out there like Handshake, um, but I think LinkedIn has been honestly a constant for me. Um, so many people are on LinkedIn and I can't stress enough how important I think it is to get a job. Plus they have like this super easy LinkedIn, easy apply. So if you just like want to apply like on the go, like you're waiting in line to get food, you can apply to a job right then and there, which is awesome. Well, um, I don't know if uh, we're connected on there, but I'll find you. Yeah, I'm, I should be easy to find. I'm usually the only Flora Quinby. I think I'm the only Flora Quinby in the world. So <laughs> that well, that's really funny. Easy. There is another Christina Previtt and it's so weird because every once in a while I'll get some I like got her Nordstrom receipt once to my email. Oh, well, that's so and weird. It's so strange. We found each other on Facebook and so we became friends. So one time I messaged her, I'm like, I think I just got your Nordstrom receipt. <laughs> okay, sorry, someone thought I was you. <laughs> it's so okay. strange. I think there's a Frank Quinby somewhere in the world. Um, because I got like emails from like him at one or like for him at oh, one like point. F Quinby. Yeah. But yeah, I use email. Um like constantly email LinkedIn are my like two big ones that I use all the time. Um, Let's so. stay in touch. I mean, I'll, I'll be watching you on Instagram and um, I'll, I'm excited to see what you'll be doing with thinking STEM. So yeah, if you ever want to come back on and promote anything, let me know. Thanks. I will. Yeah. I think once thinking STEM gets up and running, it'll be good. We're definitely planning to make some books um, like children's books and adult books has gone like, these are, this is, this is the cool stuff about science. Like this is why science is awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. I have a lot get of, some, I'll get some of your books for my goddaughter. Yes. Thank you for being so generous with your time. I'm happy to join. And, um, would love to do it again sometime. And, uh, I can't wait till you go into space. Hopefully so it's sooner rather than later. I have a feeling it's going to be right. <laughs> 